Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to today's the Hindu analysis on our YouTube channel. I hope all of you have been following all these videos that we upload every evening at 7 p.m. If you are, please make sure that you do subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notified as soon as we upload these videos. Now let's begin our analysis for today with the first article that is focusing on what the Supreme Court has done in the Rajiv Gandhi assassination case. Now this has been a topic that has been in the mainstream media for many months now. Just to give you a short recap. one of the accused in the rajiv gandhi assassination case that is perari valan who has been locked up in the jails in tamil nadu for over 31 years now he was recently released after the supreme court had intervened in the matter now the big question in this entire episode is that we have read in indian polity that the power to pardon is exclusively given to the president of india in case of offences with respect to the union government law and with respect to the court martial while when the offence is with respect to a state government law the power to pardon or to give remission is with the governor nowhere in the constitution does it say that the supreme court can take up these powers however this is what has happened now and thus it has given rise to this big debate that is can the supreme court come in between and say that we will decide if the person has to be pardoned or remission has to be given or not in this matter what the supreme court has done is they have used their powers given under article 142 now i am sure all of you are well learned students and you are aware of what article 142 is if not let me remind you article 142 gives almost unlimited powers to the supreme court it says that the supreme court can give any directive through which it believes that it will do complete justice in the society now this gives the power to the supreme court to intervene in almost any matter under the sun just by saying that we are doing this under the powers given to us by article 142 now all of you are aware that articles 72 and article 161 give the powers to the president of india and to the state governors to use their power of pardon or remission in case of certain offences the constitution also says that they don't have to act on their own discretion they are bound by the advice given to them by the council of ministers in this matter as well now in case of the rajiv gandhi assassination the history is that after rajiv gandhi was assassinated the case was transferred to the cbi a lot of people were arrested and they were sent to the prison now over the years individually a lot of people were punished however the case of mr perari valan is very very significant here now he was arrested on the charges that he as a young man bought two batteries that is two normal cells which were eventually used in making of the bomb that had resulted in the killing of rajiv gandhi at that point of time now during the investigation the cbi had claimed that mr perari valan had said that yes when i bought the cells and i handed it over i knew that they will be used for making bombs on this basis he was given this punishment However in 2013 something very very significant happened in 2013 the CBI officer came up in the open and publicly said that no this did not happen during the investigation mr perari valan had actually said that yes i had bought the cells but i had no idea when and where would they be used on this particular basis there has been a demand that mr perari valan should be released or at least should be given a remission now because this case also involves tamil sentiments most of the people who were involved in this case were tamilians the tamil nadu government irrespective of whichever party is in power has always had kind of a sympathetic view towards the people who have been locked up in the prison under this offence and that is why multiple times there have been resolutions passed in the tamil nadu assembly for the release of people who have been in this jail for killing of rajiv gandhi and this has happened irrespective of whichever party has been in power in tamil nadu now in this particular case the issue is that a mercy petition was written by mr perari valan and sent to the tamil nadu governor the governor was advised by his council of ministers to accept this mercy petition and release the person however the governor did not take any decision for over 2 years and after that he did something very very unique that is the governor actually transferred this mercy petition or recommended it to the president of india 
Now, this is very, very odd because it is the bills that the governor can transfer to the president of India and not the mercy petitions. Now, the center government has been saying that because this matter has been investigated by the CBI, that is a center investigative agency, the mercy petition and the power to grant mercy is with the president of India and not with the state governor. In all of this, the Supreme Court has now come in between and said that First, the governor was wrong in transferring this particular case to the president. Secondly, governor was also wrong in not being able to decide on the mercy petition for such a long time. And that is why we are now coming in between and we are giving the order to release Mr. Perarivalan from the jail after more than three decades now. This has led to a lot of questions being asked on this matter only. And this is why this article has been written. The author here says that yes, the governor was wrong in not taking any decision for a long time, even though the advice given by the council of ministers were very, very clear. The governor was again wrong in transferring this mercy petition to the president of India. However, in all of this, it does not merit that the Supreme Court should intervene in between because it sets a very, very dangerous and wrong precedent. The Supreme Court should understand that the article number 142 has been given in the constitution for extraordinary circumstances and it should not be used as frequently as it is being used in the past few years. This is the argument given by the author here. Not just this, Supreme Court by doing this is also going against its own judgments in the initial years. For example, in 2004, a constitutional bench of Supreme Court had said that governor acting in his own discretion is not odd. It might happen under certain circumstances. So it might happen in this circumstance also. So the Supreme Court should not have intervened in between and hijacked the entire process. Also, whether or not the governor is competent to grant pardon or remission under other offenses such as the Foreigners Act, Arms Act, Explosives Act, etc. is still not clear from this judgment of the Supreme Court. There are multiple issues. The first issue is the misuse of the power given to the Supreme Court under Article 142. What are the circumstances under which this article can be invoked is still not clear. Yes, the Supreme Court bench found a fault with the governor in not being able to take decision even after recommendation has been given by the cabinet. Yes, the fault was also in transferring the case to the president. But still, Ideally, the Supreme Court should have persuaded the governor only to decide on this matter rather than intervening on its own. The second issue in this case is that yes, the constitution does not give any time limit on the governor to take a decision on the mercy petition. In fact, we have seen mercy petitions, especially at the center government level, being delayed by many, many years without any decision being taken. So this is not happening for the first time. Thus, the Supreme Court again should not have interfered in this particular matter as per this author. Because right now, we still don't have any clarity as to what will happen if these kind of cases are repeated in the future once again. Now, there are two very, very important pointers here on which I would like to give you some add-on information. First, being the governor's delay in deciding the mercy petition and second, being Article 142. Let's first focus on the delay in the governor's decision making while deciding on the mercy petition. Now, as I said, the pardon request was first given to the governor in 2015. However, it was not considered by the governor then because the governor thought that no, this should go to the president only. However, it was a Supreme Court order in 2018 that clarified that yes, governor is within his or her power to decide on such a mercy petition. Once the governor was given the authority to decide, the state government sent their notification to the governor. The central government all through this has been against this and they have been of the view that the pardon request should be given to the president because the case is being investigated by a central agency that is the CBI. The petition on the other hand has been saying that the convict is free to choose between the president and the governor when it comes to where exactly would he or she send the mercy petition. In fact, the petitioner's side actually referred to an argument of 2015 in which the Supreme Court had said that the exercise of executive clemency was vested in the president or the governor. So, it gives a right to the convict to choose where he or she has to send the mercy petition. This is what the petitioners have been arguing. However, now that the case has been decided and the person has been released, this matter is done and dusted. But, 
it's also time for us to focus on what article 142 is in fact questions on article 142 have been asked both in the mains examination and in the prelims examinations in the past few years article 142 gives discretionary power to the supreme court to exercise its jurisdiction in a manner that it thinks will bring complete justice in the matter that is pending before it and this has been utilized by the supreme court in multiple cases be it giving justice to a lot of under trials who have been in the prisons for many many years or be it in the union carbide case which is also known as a bhopal gas tragedy the supreme court in such cases plays itself above the laws made by the parliament or by the state legislature so that it could do complete justice in such cases However, this has also led to voices of the people who say that this translates to judicial overreach. See, the Indian constitution is based on the doctrine of separation of powers. Executive, legislative and the judiciary have been given their own realms of power and they are not expected to interfere with each other. Because if they do, it will lead to a disturbance of this very delicate balance. In fact, separation of powers is a part of the basic structure of the Indian constitution. And now with Article 142, since the judiciary can override it at its own will, there are a lot of people who have been complaining that Article 142 goes against the entire concept of the separation of powers. And that is why it has to be used very, very sparingly only in cases where it is required and the judiciary should also understand the same as per the author. The next article that we have here is an interesting take on what Germany has been doing in the Ukraine-Russia crisis. Now we know Germany as being one of the strongest European nations, one of the most robust European economies and one of the leaders of the EU. Thus it was expected that after the Ukraine-Russia crisis began, Germany will take a very very strong stand. However, interestingly this has not happened and there are various reasons behind it. For example, the authors here are pointing out that if you have to understand the position of the German government right now, you have to look at the German past. See, all of you have read world history. In World War I, World War II, there is little doubt over the fact that Germany played a major role in both these wars actually starting. In fact, the entire world right now altogether blames Germany single-handedly for beginning of the Second World War. Even today, terms such as Nazi, or Hitler have been utilized to indicate towards the hate and violence that was actually a part of the Second World War. And Germany knows all of this and they are embarrassed about this to a large extent. That is why after the Second World War got over, Germany has made a lot of attempts to ensure that they change their image. So much so that Germany has avoided being a part of conflicts as much as possible. They have not invested a lot in their military, Instead, what they have done is they have been a part of a lot of peace processes. They have been a part of a lot of diplomatic processes. And that is why today's Germany, despite being one of the largest economies of Europe, despite being economically very, very strong, is not a very strong military power if you actually look towards it. For example, when Ukraine was actually asking for arms from entire Europe and USA, what Germany could offer was only a few tanks which were so old that they did not even have any ammunition. That is not because Germany did not want to give it latest weapons. But the fact is that Germany does not have any latest state-of-the-art tanks because they have not really thought about buying those. Because their point of view right now is of non-violence and their entire population supports those political parties who want to remain away from violence. And that is why even in the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war, you see that Germany has avoided criticizing Russia to a large extent. Then there is the other point of view also, that is Germany's dependence on Russia's oil. As we know, after the Fukushima nuclear power disaster of Japan, a lot of developed nations such as Germany, France, etc. have been trying to go away from nuclear power. And Germany is no different. In the past decade or so, they have shut down a lot of their nuclear power plants and thus their dependence on natural gas, which is supplied in large quantity from Russia, has increased considerably. That is also one of the reasons why Germany has avoided criticizing Russia. They always thought that they have a close relationship with Russia and they would be able to persuade Russia not to start a war. However, that has not happened. 
and that is why we see germany right now being stuck between the two sides yes they have a responsibility towards europe they have a responsibility towards eu nato etc but they are also bound by their long term strategic posture that is not supporting violence and not supporting war and that is the point of view of entire german population so much so that recently germany decided to send its navy just to protect certain shipping lines so that its exports are protected even that was criticized by large section of media within germany so even if they are deploying their military for peaceful purposes even then the people of germany are not really in favor of this however something very very interesting happened in march that is soon after the russia ukraine crisis began all of a sudden there was a realization among the german leadership that it is time to wake up and invest a lot more in our defense many experts say that the german military has been short of defense budget for a very very long time now and this is true with almost entire europe see if you look at the how strategic leaders of the world and thinkers of the world have been writing there have been a lot of views which say that europe is kind of a lazy continent right now they are one of the richest continents in the world they make up about 1/4 of the global gdp but the fact is that ever since the second world war got over europe has almost exported its security to the us they know that since we are a part of nato if anything happens to us the us will come and support us so a lot of european countries have been too casual about their security not spending a lot on their defense budget not spending a lot on ensuring that their military remains up to date and that is why you see that within europe you don't really see a lot of joint military exercises also in fact if you remember when donald trump became the president of us he had actually said that i want the european countries to increase their defense spending in nato also because it is a us only that is spending a lot of money and not these european nations and that was true and germany is a prime example of that germany in fact as i said earlier has worked very very hard to come out of its image of the second world war so much so that hitler's autobiography that is may camp you can buy this book in india and many other parts of the world but in germany itself it was actually prohibited for many many years and that is an indication of how germany has been trying for a makeover in its image of the past few decades and that is why they have worked very very hard to not be involved in wars and conflicts in fact since the end of the cold war germany has only been involved in two conflicts and not more than that and that also is not their own conflict that is because they are a part of nato and they send their forces to afghanistan and the balkan wars in fact germany did not participate in the american invasion of iraq although it was a part of nato and usa wanted to convince germany to be a part of it but they still remained away from it in fact germany came up to negotiate the minsk agreements between ukraine and russia which took place after the crimea invasion of 2014 thus for germany it is much more preferable to be a part of peace agreements rather than taking a side when the war is going on between two of its neighbors the next article that we have is about india's ev ambitions that is electrical vehicle ambitions now the fact is when we talk about ev the first thing that comes to our mind is ev cars or maybe ev two wheelers a lot of ev two wheelers now can be seen on our roads made by companies such as ether ola etc but the article here is saying that the one thing that all of us have ignored is that the one sector where ev has actually made a big mark in india is actually the three wheeler sector if you look at how the two wheeler three wheeler and four wheeler market in india among the ev is divided you will see that it is largely dominated by the three wheelers so much so that out of all the e vehicles registered in india three wheelers make up about 65% of them thus indicating the fact that the government is doing something right while giving a push to evs among the three wheelers a lot of credit also has to be given to the fame 2 scheme that is a second version of the fame scheme under which the government of india has been giving a push to building much better infrastructure for charging for ev vehicles and also making these prices much more affordable now as per the fame 2 scheme the government of india had set a target of at least 5 lakh three wheelers out of which 4 lakh have already been bought and the experts believe that by 2023 the number will cross 5 lakh target very very easily now the credit for all these three wheelers being sold in such a large number is primarily given to five states assam 
बिहार डेली यूपी एंड वेस्ट बेंगाल दीज फाइव टूगेदर मेकअप एट्टी परसेंट ऑफ ऑल द इलेक्ट्रिक थ्री व्हीलर्स इन इंडिया विद यूपी अलोन अकाउंटिंग फॉर फोर्टी परसेंट ऑफ ऑल द थ्री व्हीलर रजिस्ट्रेशन अक्रॉस द कंट्री नाउ देर आर लॉट ऑफ रीजन वाई दीज आर द स्टेट दैट आर डूइंग सो वेल वेन इट कम्स टू थ्री व्हीलर ई वी रजिस्ट्रेशन फर्स्ट द कॉस्ट ओवरऑल इज नॉट वेरी हाई इट इज बिटवीन वन एंड वन पॉइंट फाइव लैक that is the cost of the ev amongst the three wheelers that is mainly because we have a lot of players entering the market it is not just the established ones such as bajaj mahindra etc but a lot of new players have come in and there is a healthy competition which is reducing the cost also these states have brought in very very good policies to give a lot of exemptions to ev buyers like all these five states provide 100% road tax exemption and on registration fee as well now for example if you are buying a car you would see that depending upon state to state about 15 to 20% cost of the car is to be given in terms of the road tax so if you are buying a car for let's say 13 14 lakh right now out of that most probably only 10 to 11 lakh is going to the car company the rest of it will be given to insurance and for the road tax so road tax is a major component because of which the cost of the vehicle actually gets increased However, for electric three wheelers, these five states are letting go of their road tax, which has made sure that the cost of these electric three wheelers is very, very affordable. In fact, there are also other incentives given, such as low interest on the loans, incentives on scrappage of these vehicles, etc., depending upon their battery size. So we are seeing how these five states and the push that they are giving to EV has resulted in great results on the ground. the other good part is that the design that is being followed is indigenous so most of the manufacturing is local and that is why the cost is very very affordable however the one negative part here is that because we are focusing a lot on keeping the cost in check we may be compromising on the safety features this is where the regulators of the government have to come in because the passenger vehicles especially like the three wheelers which have the driver and other passengers in those vehicles there is specially a need to have much better safety regulations we have seen how a lot of electric two wheelers are catching fire and that is why a lot of people are avoiding buying these if government of india wants to avoid the same situation three wheelers and wants to improve and expand our ev market in the coming years we have to ensure that the safety is not ignored even though we have to keep on making it affordably the one scheme that this article talked about was a fame scheme f a m e the fame scheme right now is in the second phase of it the first phase started in 2015 and the second phase started in 2019 now this scheme covers both hybrid and electric vehicles and focuses on four areas first technology development demand creation of the evs in the market pilot projects and charging infrastructure which is a very very critical part of convincing people to buy ev vehicles there has also been emphasis given to ensure that public transportation also converts into ev that is why we are seeing a lot of ev three wheelers and even buses being adopted by the government as well in the two wheeler segment the government is giving a push to the private vehicles as we are seeing across the country now one of the most important components of any ev vehicle is the battery which costs the biggest amount now the government of india is trying to introduce advanced lithium ion batteries which ensure that there is a much better battery backup for all these vehicles however these batteries come at a cost and that is why the government has to intervene by giving certain subsidies the scheme is also trying to establish much better charging infrastructure and the aim is to have at least one charging station in a 3 km by 3 km grid across the country one of the other problem with electric vehicles is people don't buy it thinking that they won't be able to go on long drives because in between the highways if their charging is over they would need certain charging stations thus the government is also planning to have such charging stations on both sides of the roads on national highways in an interval of about 25 km each this is what the government's plan is in the long run now if you want to know more about the status of ev vehicle registration in india and how fast is it developing you just have to google e amrit that is a government portal which gives you the information about how ev vehicles in india are expanding and you can get a lot more up to date information from here The next article that we have here is about the Aadhaar controversy that happened just a few days back. 
So what happened was the government of India first leased a notification saying that people should avoid giving photocopies of their Aadhaar cards to anyone. Also, if you have downloaded your Aadhaar card on a cyber cafe or on a public computer, you should delete it permanently because it can be misused. If you have to give your Aadhaar number to anyone, for example, right now, from buying a SIM card to opening a bank account to having your passport for every such thing, you require your Aadhaar number to be shared. So the government is saying that when someone asks you for the Aadhaar card number, don't give him the Aadhaar card, rather give them the masked Aadhaar. Now, Mars Aadhaar is a number that actually hides the first eight digits of your 12-digit Aadhaar card and only shows the last four digits. Also, share it only with those authorities that are entitled to take your Aadhaar card. Private authorities such as hotels, etc. should not take your Aadhaar card and they cannot keep the copies of the Aadhaar card. This was a circular that was released by the government. However, when it was released, a lot of people had concerns thinking that, oh, our Aadhaar card now is not really safe. Realizing this, the government quickly withdrew the circular and said that it has been misunderstood and we don't mean to say that Aadhaar is unsafe right now. However, this has brought forward all the questions of Aadhaar that have been in front of us ever since Aadhaar was introduced. Now, the main law as per the usage of Aadhaar card is the Aadhaar Targeted Delivery of Financial and Other Subsidies Beneficiaries Act of 2016. As per this act, it is clear that you have to share your Aadhaar card number if you have to get government benefits which come from the Consolidated Fund of India. Although Supreme Court has time and again clarified that no one should be denied of his or her benefits if they don't have Aadhaar card. But we also know that in real life, if you don't have Aadhaar card right now, it becomes extremely difficult for you to get something that you want from the government side or even from the private sector right now. The problem with Aadhaar card is very simple. If you have to get your Aadhaar card made, you have to share a lot of personal information, including your biometric data, etc. Also, day by day, the government of India is asking you to link a lot of important documents with the Aadhaar card. Be it the PAN card, be it your bank account, a lot of very, very important documents that you hold are now linked with your Aadhaar card. Meaning that if someone with wrong intentions can get hold of your Aadhaar number, they can get hold of a lot of other information that you have. And that is why it is essential that all this information that you are giving to UIDAI while getting your Aadhaar card made, that has to be preserved with the highest possible form of technology. And this is the problem. Ever since Aadhaar came into our lives, there have been multiple news stories about how the data has been leaked. In fact, every six or seven months, you do have some news that Aadhaar data is leaked in this state or that state. In fact, a few years back, there was a news that even if you Google, you can get Aadhaar data of a lot of people which should ideally have been hidden. The government and the UIDAI have always said that no, this is not true. In fact, something very interesting came up in 2018. In 2018, the chairman of TRI, that is Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, tweeted his Aadhaar number on Twitter and said that I am giving my Aadhaar number and I challenge anyone to come out with any personal information using my Aadhaar. He was trying to prove that even if you share your Aadhaar data, everything is secure. But within a few hours, a lot of people started digging up his mobile number, his PAN card number, his photographs, his residential address, date of birth, etc. to prove that yes, using the Aadhaar card, we can get all this information. That became a big controversy. Even after that, there have been multiple reports and incidents that have said that Aadhaar data has been compromised. Now, recently, the CAG of India actually came out with a report about how Aadhaar has worked. That report has been based on Aadhaar from 2015 to 2019. That is a working of the UIDAI. Does it need to change anything? And what are the problems? The CAG, in fact, reported that UIDAI has not specified any encryption algorithm to keep all the data secure, which is a very, very worrying sign. The CAG report also said that apart from the issue of multiple Aadhaars, that is one person having multiple Aadhaar cards, which is illegal, there are also issues of multiple people having the same biometric data because of which the UIDAI had to delete 4.75 lakh Aadhaar numbers for being duplicate which points out towards the fact that there are still a lot of leakages 
and the UIDAI and the government have not been able to effectively plug those leakages. So there was this very serious report that has actually caused even more questions on the Aadhaar. As I said, there have been multiple reports of Aadhaar data leakage. Let me show you a few examples. April 2019, this was a news. That is, threat of large-scale misuse of Aadhaar data is real. It was when an IT company proved that they can get access to Aadhaar data without needing any permission. Then again, in Feb 2019, there was a report that there has been a leakage of Aadhaar data in multiple states across the country. Now, the article does mention a bit about the CAG report, but does not give a lot of detail about what exactly did the report say. So I went through the report and I took out the important pointers that you need to know. Now, this is what the report of the CAG said. It points out that number one, no document for the proof of residency has been prescribed by the Aadhaar. That is, the Aadhaar is meant for only those people who have resided in India for at least 182 days in a year. But when you go and actually get your Aadhaar card made, they don't really ask for any document to prove if you have been in India for 182 days or not. So this is a major problem with Aadhaar. Second, there is the duplication problem. As we discussed, the UIDAI had to cancel over 4.75 lakh Aadhaar cards because they were duplicates. On an average, 145 duplicate Aadhaar cards are being generated every single day as per the CAG. The CAG also found fault in the enrollment process and said that the UIDAI is charging people for biometric update even when poor quality data was given at the time of enrollment. So for example, if I go to have an Aadhaar card made, I give my fingerprints and the authority or the enrollment center could not take my fingerprints properly. And later on, they report that no, it was a mistake. You have to give the fingerprints again. So if I update my data, even though it was not my mistake, even then the UIDI will take money from me. That is a problem that CAG has highlighted. Another problem is about the children below five years of age. Now, Aadhaar card is issued to children below five years of age and to newborns, which are called the Baal Aadhaar. Now, as per the CAG, we need to review that because anyways, after five years, the child has to apply for a new regular Aadhaar. So the unique identity is not matched anyway. So we might need to think about this idea and we might need to make a rule that Aadhaar should be made only after five years of age. Before that, you can link it with the Aadhaar card of the parents. These are the recommendations that the CAG had given. Number one, prescribe a procedure properly for self-declaration to know where the person has lived for the past year or so. Secondly, we should also have better SLA, that is service level agreement parameters. These are the parameters or the agreements that any organization has to sign if they are asking for Aadhaar data from other people to prove their identity. Like when you go and buy a SIM card, they actually ask for your Aadhaar card. So the SIM card companies have to get this kind of an agreement from the UIDAI that has to be much more strengthened. Then we also have to find better ways to create uniqueness of the biometric identity because we have to solve this issue of Aadhaar card of children below the age of five years. And also think again about charging the fees for reviewing of the biometric data collected incorrectly at the first place. These are some of the important recommendations given by the CAG in that report. The next article that we have here is about a UN report that has recently come out about the Taliban regime. So what has happened is that the analytical support and sanctions monitoring team of the UNSC has given this report about the status of Taliban in Afghanistan. The interesting part is no one went to Taliban. So this is not an on ground report. This is just a report with the inputs taken from experts in different fields. So they point out that there are still multiple foreign terrorist organizations that have their safe haven in Taliban. The good part is that they don't have a lot of finances now. Because of this, we should not expect any big terrorist attack around the world before 2023, that is, before they actually get hands on finances. For India specifically, the two terrorist groups that focus on India, that is the Jashe Mohammed and Lashkar Taiba, also have multiple training camps in Afghanistan, which is a major, major cause of concern for us. However, there is a cause of concern for Pakistan also. Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan has the largest component of foreign terrorist fighters in Afghanistan and their main focus has been of fighting against Pakistan. They have about 3,000 to 4,000 of 
the fighters in Afghanistan right now. Now, these are the main pointers from this report. Since this is not an on-ground report, the actual numbers may be different. It does not really speak anything about India specifically. I have read the report myself. It only talks about the ongoing problems among the Taliban leaders. It talks about what exactly can be the possible sources of revenue for Taliban, such as the opium trade, etc. But it does not talk about any danger that India or any other nation specifically is facing from Taliban right now. This also gives us a chance to revisit how India is very, very closely connected with Afghanistan. Now, you would have read this earlier as well. In the past decade or so, India invested heavily in infrastructure development within Afghanistan. That includes the Zaranj Delaram Highway Project, which will give an alternative entry to Afghanistan for India without worrying about Pakistan. We also ensure that there is power transmission line from Uzbek border to Kabul over the Hindu Kush mountains. However, the biggest sign of collaboration between India and Afghanistan has been the Salma Dam, also called the Afghan-India Friendship Dam. Now, Although all these are old developments and nothing new has happened, but this is just to remind you that although Taliban has taken over Afghanistan, India must officially resume our diplomatic relationship because we have to accept the reality. In comparison, if you see in Myanmar, where the country has also been overtaken by their military, India still has diplomatic contact with Myanmar. But with Afghanistan, we have not done so. We have to understand that all this infrastructure investment that we have made will be safeguarded only and only when we resume our diplomatic relationship with Taliban. And the good part is that Taliban has also indicated towards the same that they do want to resume their relationship with India. But this has not happened on the ground till now. These are the important articles from the Hindu newspaper today. Now a couple of practice questions. Number one, assess the performance of FAME 2 scheme across the country and the roadblocks that still remain in place in expanding the EV accessibility in India. Second, what is Article 142 of the Indian Constitution? Does it go against the doctrine of separation of powers? Elaborate. Both the questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video.